Well, thank you, Randy, and thank you to all of you who are here in this. It's so exciting for me to be here, let alone to be celebrating my 30th Stanford reunion with so many people in my class that I see out there and I still recognize, still can see, still recognize. But I got to tell you, I would have never predicted that 30 years ago when I was sitting out there that I would ever be standing up here, that if I, and even if I was standing up here, clearly the topic would not be aging. Um, I could have never predicted that um, I would have been, uh, I speak for Myra Strober's work family balance classes on elder care, uh, that I would speak to Stanford faculty and staff on the Medicare prescription drug program, or that I would have written an article for Stanford Business Magazine on a subject that's become very near and dear to my heart, which is creating moments of joy in the elder care experience. But probably most of all, I would have never predicted that I would have felt that my greatest accomplishment was my role as caregiver to my mother for the last 10 years of her life. So that was, that's the elder care side. But today we're going to wear the gerontologist's hat, and we're going to ta be talking about successful aging. And I want to make you just as successful in this next phase of life as you have been up to this point so far. So that's my goal. I want you to be successful in the next phase of life, but I will tell you success is a very different playing field from how you de defined success before. And I can tell you there is no correlation between success in business and success in aging. No correlation there. Um, but you are one up because there is a correlation with education. So the education that we did get 30 whatever many years ago here at Stanford is going gonna, is gonna to put you one up in terms of successful aging. So some of the things I'm going to talk about today you would have heard. Some of them are common knowledge to you. Some of them are going to be new. Some of them may be a challenge to accept for you. I'm going to be bringing some of the, um, there's a lot of thought leaders in the field of aging and very supportive, positive, positive aging um, resources here at Stanford that I'm going to bring into my presentation. And then I'm actually going to show you some role models of aging from my family and friends. So you're going to see me with different haircuts, different weights. As of this morning, somebody said, oh, a different hair color, Esther. So maybe even different hair colors today. Um, but these are the role models in my family, but I am sure that there are role models amongst your family and friends. So I really want you to think about those people. What is it, and I think you're just going to see some themes here that these people have um, uh, taken on in their life. And I want to remind you to remember those people. You know, I have a seven minute memory. I'm lucky if I can remember something within seven minutes of hearing it. So you're probably not going to remember everything I've said, but I want you, those role models, to be reminders to you going forward. So why don't we, why don't we start here? Um, successful aging. I bet you think I came up because this is a business school group, successful aging. Actually, successful aging is indeed a gerontological term. And the American Gerontological Society defines successful aging as not just to add life, as to year, add years to life, but to put life into those years. So I know if you went into a bookstore, not that they have an aging section, but you know, you'd see books on diet and fitness. That's the putting the years into the life. That's the health, um, uh, physical and mental health. But to put the life into years, that's the emotional well-being. You know, mind, body, that's the soul. And I love the word joy, so to me it's having a joy-filled life. Whatever you, whatever words might fit with you, but it's the emotional well-being that's, that's, really, that's really the key. Um, and so as we push this envelope of a lifetime, it is less so in our genes or in the stars but it's really all about the choices we make. And lifestyle choices play a far greater role in successful aging than genetics, wealth, or race. So two top lines. It's emotional well-being and it's lifestyle choices. So um, now for some of you, well, let's get right into it. There's a few, <laughs> there's a few barriers to successful aging. Denial and dysfunctional families. You know, if denial was a disease, the results would be fatal. 
I don't know what it is about human nature, but there's this gap between knowing and doing. And you know, what you resist does indeed persist. And what you want to do is you want to narrow that gap and you want to step, you want to step forward. Because frequently the angst associated with denial is far greater than the discomfort that might come from acceptance and moving on. And then al although people may think that acknowledging aging is giving into it, I would say just the opposite. Not acknowledging aging is in giving into it because you lose options. And those, there's an opportunity cost to those options. It's an opportunity cost in terms of your emotional well-being, your health, and there can be a financial cost to it too. So what's the breakout strategy? The breakout strategy is courage. And I got to tell you, it's going to be take less courage to acknowledge aging, think, plan, and act than it is for this gentleman who looks like he's about 70 years old. I don't really want to try rock climbing. So there really isn't as much courage to getting past this denial gap, but there is this denial gap. And I would say that um, you're only hurting yourself. It's kind of self-preservation. So my point to you would be, if not now, when? So that's denial. Let's talk about the next barrier. The next barrier is family. One of the first things that I learned in gerontology school is that aging is all about family. Childhood is all about family. Later, adulthood is all about families. And families today certainly seem dysfunctional. Now maybe this is, for most, of, for most of my class here, this was you know, the norm, Ozzie and Harriet, circa 1950s. OK, so maybe it was romanticized a little for, for TV. But what's the reality TV to show, to show today? Ozzy Osbourne. I mean, what kind of a family is that? You know? so, <laughs> so, um, family ties are less strong. Um, there's a me generation who's replaced a nuclear family. Uh, there's parent issues, sibling issues. Uh, divorce is higher. And although, people, although the, the fact that people live in different places may not be dysfunctional, but families that used to be in the same community operate more functionally. So family ties are less strong, and certainly respect for elders has declined in this culture, not necessarily in other cultures, but certainly in this culture. So what you have is that the primary support structure for aging, the family, is broken. So what's the breakout strategy here? You know, it's forgiveness. I see it time and again. There needs to be more forgiveness in this world. Um, first of all, forgive yourself for whatever you did or didn't do in your life with your family and friends. And then you got to forgive others. You know, forgive your parents for not being the parents that you would wish they had been. Forgive your children for not being the children you had wished them to become. And forgive your siblings for whatever happened in the sandbox. But you know, forgiveness, you know, it really gives you back the present and the future. Because when you, f when, when you're, when you have a grievance and you're dealing in the past, you bring it into the present. And those present days were once your future days. So really forgiveness brings you peace and it brings you back the present and the future. And here I'd like to talk a little about some of the work of Dr. Fred Luskin, who's the founder and director of the Stanford Forgiveness Project. He's known as an expert in um, the healing power of forgiveness. He has a framework for forgiveness training. If this is something that you need to work on, his book, Forgive for Good, is a wonderful model of this. He also happens to be in the middle of a um, online course of forgiveness training. He really did some powerful work with Catholic and Protestant families in Northern Ireland. And um, the research shows forgiveness positively affects relationships, leads to less stress. People who are more forgiving forget, for, report fewer health problems. And people who blame others for their problems have higher incidences of illnesses such as cardiovascular disease and cancers. So learning to forgive is not only good for your emotional well-being, it's also good for your physical and mental health. And I'll tell you, only forgiveness can produce a life without regrets. 
And it's not what you do in life that usually is regrets, it's what you didn't do. So I really encourage you to not wait to the aha moment of what's important. Don't wait to that aha moment at end of life on your deathbed as to what's important in life. You really want to learn it now, apply it to your life. And, and that's really a lesson that I learned in, with my mother. Um, we got to a point of forgiveness. I never expect anything in return, and I got, I got the world, and it does work. And, and, you know, there's some other resources for this. Mitch Album and his works on um, Tuesdays with Maury talks about what's really important in life. Um, just one more day, the five people you, you meet in heaven. That's what you want to learn now and apply it to your life. So let's, let's, let's move on. Let's go to, um, for some audiences, I say they're the seven secrets of successful aging. For this audience, it's the seven strategies for successful aging. <laughs> okay. So social networks are the elixir of life. We are social animals. And the most important relationship is indeed your spousal relationship. That is the most important one. You hear of situations where um, uh, one spouse dies and the other spouse dies very frequently after the, that, uh, that first spouse. So it's that spousal relationship that's the most, that is indeed the most important relationship, but it can't be the only relationship. You really need to get out and make other friends, particularly when you move out of the workforce. And if you're, and, and I'm talking about friends, not acquaintances. So if your, if your um, group of friends are really acquaintances from the workforce, that's not what's going to sustain you when you're out of the workforce. So you really have to make other friends, and you need to make younger friends, too. Um, family by choice also counts. It's important because families have, there's a lot of divorce, and uh, families are smaller. Family by choice counts. And, and actually, sometimes the research shows that actually, Family by choice counts better than family relationships because of those dysfunctional families that I talked about. So family by choice also counts. Um, and this is what my, mo my mother would say. This is my grandmother saying that my mother took on. To have a friend, you have to be a friend. So again, I am not talking about uh, acquaintances. I am talking about being present in a relationship. Uh, and it's, it's opening your heart and taking people in. This is the love factor. And um, two comments I wanted to make for, I'm actually an example of that. Um, a woman who is divorced, not married. I'm also no children, also happen to be an, an only child. So there are probably other women that went into business that, that have that profile. You really have to think about what is your social support structure for when you're older. And you, you really need to think, think seriously about that. And then the other comment I would make for, for some of the men in the audience, that typically it's the woman that is the nurturer of relationships. So if you are one of those people who might end up divorced or your spouse dies, you need to think about how are you, you need to nurture those relationships in your life too. So here's, um, here's Lorraine. Lorraine happened to be my client at Price Waterhouse. This is a picture of Lorraine. Uh, this was on her retirement party invitation. Um, she was retiring at 80. So this is probably when she was 79 after she came back from, uh, from Hawaii. Now, Lorraine's, Lorraine's um, she has, this is her family. She has four children, 11 grandchildren, and I think five and counting great-grandchildren. Everybody in this family wants to be with Lorraine. Everybody. And she even does bookkeeping work for her, one of her sons. Um, she's in the jazz club, and she's in two sororities, and she's doing yoga, and she's just totally totally involved, and even one of the cute stories, the two, two fellows, two of her grandsons, the older one in the front, the older ones in the front row, they both had girlfriends that were in her sorority, so she just loved the idea that she, they were all sorority sisters. One time I called her on the phone, it was a Wednesday night, and one 16-year-old from one son and a uh, eight-year-old from uh, her daughter were over at grandma's having sloppy joes during their 
during their homework, doing their homework. So this is the family structure. They all live in the same area in San Diego. This might have been more what you would have seen in another generation, but still very much intact. Um, so the next one is uh, my friend Martha. Um, Martha is in her 50s, but I know that Mar Martha is going to successfully age because of the family. She has a family, but she really believes in family by choice. And what she says is, is a loving family is but an earlier heaven. And um, there are some people in, I've, this is from uh, Christmas. There I am in the back there with my little hat with her father. And, um, well, let's talk about the saying. You are an, she had her 50th birthday, and so she invited her, her closest group of friends. 175 people came to her 50th birthday party. And these were really friends. This is not acquaintances, these are friends. But I'll tell you a story. I gave an 80th birthday party for my mother. I told her she could invite all of her friends. She had a list of 175 people at 80 years old. So you, and for her 50th birthday party, somebody put a collage of pictures together. And here's what, I love this. You are an awesome person and we consider it a privilege to call you our friend. So. Christmas dinner, this is an example of a family by choice Christmas dinner. Um, one, one gentleman here, her father went to Stanford and got his master's at Stanford and one, thanks, one Christmas brought home one of his classmates. That classmate has been having Christmas dinner with them over 50 years now. Um, and then another one of her husband's, a classmate from college, their family has been having Christmas dinner with them for 25 years. And their son, Jason, in the back there, everybody was giving toast. So Jason, I think he was like 10 or 10 or something, he got up and he gave a toast to family by choice. Those were the words he used. I mean, it was incredible. So even at the age of 10, he got the importance of family by choice. Okay, now here's a different, different situation. This is Doris. Um, Doris lived in the skilled nursing facility where my mother was. And when I first met Doris, she said, I love all animals and some humans. <laughs> she had pictures of cats and dogs and everything, had little socks with dogs on them. Um, but she was charming. And now here's someone else who, um, Doris retired at 80. She had to start work at 50. Her husband became ill, worked for 30 years, was an assistant um, at Caramont High School, worked for 30 years, retired at 80, um, was in skilled nurse. But she had just a wonderful, outgoing personality, had no family, but she developed this core group of people that I, when I would see my mother, then I'd always go down to see Doris afterwards. I was not the only person who did that. And other people, after their loved one passed away, still came back to the skilled nursing facility just to see Doris. So I gave you three examples, more of a traditional family, more of family by choice, or someone who was alone, who made, who, who, who established a, a, a friendship in a, in a different type of environment. So number two, take all those lemons and make lots of lemonade. That's what people who have successfully done, who have successfully aged done. They make lots of lemonade. This is that seeing the extraordinary in the ordinary. Or it's mature defenses, or it's resilience. Um, uh, what's the worst that can happen to me? Because when you see the big picture, the glass really is half full, maybe it's full, and it could be overflowing. And here I'd like to talk to you a little about the work of the Stanford Center on Longevity. And you heard, uh, if you went next door, you heard Dr. Tom Rando speak on some of the um, work they're doing on stem cell, the, kind of the science, but they also do a lot of research. And Dr. Laura Carstensen is the founder and director of the, set, of the center. And she's out there to debunk the misery myth here. Because the research shows that people over 65 aren't as you know, depressed as everybody seems to think. As a matter of fact, the people that are the most depressed are the 20-somethings. And when you think back on it, things are probably a lot easier for you now than they were in the 20s. So it's the socio-emotional selectivity theory. And it makes sense that as your time horizon shortens and you see the end, you change what has value to you. And you are more interested in emotional, emotionally related 
um, activities and relationships. So, and, and also uh, and emotionally, emotional goals. And you're actually, your emotional skills improve. You're less self-centered. You kind of go up Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And, um, you know, for me, the been there, done that really makes sense. You know, you've been there, you've done that, and there's a lot of things that you're not going to waste your time on or energy or... So it's, it's a different lifespan. The, the other thing is um, the positivity effect that actually our brains have a tendency when we're older to think more, you know, to eliminate the negative stimuli and we will think more in the positive. So, so there's actually re research that, that supports this. Uh, Laura is the author, has a new book out, A Long Bright Future, um, where she, um, she has an interesting section. I'm not going to uh, share it with you. I encourage you to read the book on work. Hold, she has re-envisioned work across the, across the years. Um, but her four, four areas, nourish social relationships, work longer, save more, learn throughout your life, and take care of your body. And the Longevity Center is committed to bringing about you know, profound improvement, not just focusing at end of life, but really improvement quality of the life for people who are living longer across the, across the lifespan. Um, and here's some, so here's Marcella. Marcella, I called Marcella my surrogate grandmother. And Marcella, hap my mother was a teacher. Marcella happened to be the principal at this, one of the schools that my mother taught at. And this is probably taken after Stanford. This is probably in the mid 80s. We would always bring her out for brunch. And um, Marcella, I mean, she, she was born in 1900. And I kn Marcella died at 4 a.m. in the year 2000, in the millennium. And I know that she just wanted to make, to make it to two centuries. And I know that she had a smile on her face when she got it there. But she was going to make it to the year 2000 because she was born in 1900. Um, Irish Catholic, went to church every day. Um, but the, the great, best story I have about Marcella is that I, I took her out for a dinner one time. And I purposely wanted to take her to a meat market because I thought she'd get a kick out of watching you know, the guys pick up the girls and everything. So I took her to a TGI Fridays. In, um, <laughs> she, you know, hey, come on, these people, they've got life in them. 85 years old, yeah, she enjoyed going to the meat market. So, so then when I get her there, then you know, I'm really serious. And I said, well, Marcella, I really brought you here because I want to know your philosophy of life. True story. And not, not necessarily that she said it in this order, but first she said, well, I eat pretty well. I have steak and potatoes, but of course the steak back then probably wasn't all marbled, and it probably wasn't French fries. It was, you know, boiled potatoes. Um, yeah, and I have a drink every once in a while. And actually, sometimes Marcella would ask me. She had a, 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 a young boy from the neighborhood buy her groceries, but sometimes I'm the one who would buy her liquor. So she'd say, "Would you get? But you need to get me the whiskey in the plastic container because she couldn't hold the lick, the the glass one anymore. So I had to buy the liquor. So she drinks a little. I like a little little drink. And then she said, "You know, I don't worry. I really don't worry that much. You know, I thought about it one day, and I thought, what's the worst that can happen to me? And then I really thought about the worst that could happen to me, and I thought, you know what? I can deal with that." And then I went on to think about, what's the probability that that worst thing is going to happen to me? And I said, you know, it's probably never going to be, ha it's never going to happen. So why will I waste today worrying about tomorrow? You know, I gave you the forgiveness. Why take yesterdays and lose todays? Here's somebody saying, why worry about tomorrow? I lose my todays. So that's, that's how she, you know, it's like, it's this. It's it's seeing the world in a different in different eyes. The other thing is, they did a study on centurions, and when somebody people live to to be a hundred, you know they've lost a lot of things in life. There's an ability to deal with loss. So again, there's this resiliency, um, mature defenses. Because by the time you've been a hundred, you've lost family, you've lost friends, you've lost physical abilities, mental abilities position in the workforce, position in the community. But it's this ability to deal with loss. You see the glass, the glass is always half full or overflowing. Another one is my Aunt Greta. At this picture, my Aunt Greta is probably about 105 years old. 
She died at 107. Um, Aunt Greta, I was told at her 100th birthday, was wearing high heels and dancing out there. And in this picture, she, she did have difficulty walking, so she was in a wheelchair. But ladies, she was wearing a cable knit three-piece, bur beautiful burgundy. You can tell from the beautiful burgundy three-piece cable knit pantsuit with her pearl necklace, her pearl earrings, her coiffed, hair coiffed, lipstick, and I swear to you, I remember her in black stockings and Ferragamo pumps. If they had Vogue, for, and she had beautiful skin, if they had Vogue, Vogue for Santarians, my Aunt Greta should have been on the cover. But now, Aunt Greta lived with a couple, and Keith was the, the husband, so Keith would pick up her, uh, she was in Nova Scotia, Keith would pick up her um, drugs at the pharmacy, and pharmacies there also have like a retail portion. So she would call the pharmacist, give, give him her credit card, and to have a little purchase that would go in the bag. And she said, now, Keith, don't look in the bag. And of course, Keith did. Otherwise, I couldn't tell you this story. And um, it was Oil of Olay. She, has, she could have been the poster child for Oil of Olay. And I've had other clients who have used Oil of Olay. Ladies, I think we've got to go to Oil of Olay. It really, we, we got some really longitudinal studies here. It really works. <laughs> So, dancing at 100 and oil of Olay at till, I'm sure, 107. So, point number three, live with integrity. This is living by the golden rule. Never forget to say thank you. And when in doubt, forgive. And I'll tell you the best example of, well, respect, gratitude, it's other words, respect, gratitude, and grace. Respect allows for acceptance. Gratitude brings happiness. And forgiveness softens the heart. And the best example I can give of that is, uh, is my mom. Um, my mother was, she was, the two words, that she, two words that she used most of all were thank you. She always said thank you. The next three, and we were told, whether it was be in the hospital or, or whatever senior living facility she was in, that we were some of the few people who did, did thank, thank, say thank you. Next three words she used were, I love you, which were the words that I got the benefit of. But I'll tell you, that wasn't words we used when I was growing up. And how that started was my goddaughter in her teens, when she'd leave me a message or whenever she talked to me, she would say, I love you, Esther. I got that on my message machine once. I kept it, and it just made me feel so good. So I started saying that to my mother. So this became the words that we use so much in later life. Um, one time my mother came to me, and uh, it was after she had fractured a hip, and we were in, she was in skilled nursing. I went to see her. She starts with, well, I had a talk with Major Domo today. That was usually not my mother's tone. I had no idea what had happened, and Major Domo was the executive director of the skilled nursing facility. So, well, Mom, what, what happened? Well, I told him that the residents don't have enough respect for the AIDS. Not the AIDS don't have enough respect for the residents. The residents don't have enough respect for the AIDS. That's how my mother thought. That's a point of being grateful, even when my mother got to uh, closer to end of life, she was no longer, she was non-ambulatory, she couldn't walk, she couldn't move in bed, she had to be fed. She was happy and there was a smile on her face. And there was a twinkle in her eye. And I actually was at a function, um, actually yesterday, for, at Golden Gate University, and it happened that uh, honoring a friend of mine as alumnus of the year, and it happened that the head of the, um, the major domo of that skilled nursing facility, who's in Rotary with my friend, was there. And she, she even commented, you know, Esther, when your mom was there, everybody loved seeing your mom. We always got her dressed up, but there was a joy. I really felt she lived as long as she did was the joy that she brought into the world and the joy she brought out in other people. So number four, start and end each day with a smile. You know, let's, let's, a sense of humor goes a long way, and I got to tell you, grandchildren go a long way. Any kind of young children. I am leaving next uh, Thursday to go to uh, my grandchildren, aged two girls, three and seven, are in Boston, and I go trick-or-treating with them every year. So I, I'm the cool grandma 
who goes in costumes. So this year I have my Cleopatra, I'm kind of Cleopatra outfit, my black wig. I always have a wig, and I have a King Tut headdress. So <laughs> anything, anything with grandchildren is, is good. Um, and don't take yourself too seriously, you know? Really, don't take yourself too seriously, particularly in the next phase. And make sure you have some fun. I've, we've talked, diff whatever your definition of fun is. Now, this isn't fun to me, but I had to have something here for the men in the audience. This may be absolute fun for you. So whatever it is, make sure you have some fun. It's seeing the extraordinary in the ordinary. And I will tell you, the time value of joy it only takes a moment. When you think about those really important points in your life, they were moments. So take time for those moments of joy. So here's Marcella again. This is a picture of um, my former boyfriend. Some of you might remember him. And Marcella, and this is my Annie B. And we would always go, we would generally go out, um, usually to brunch. And so we go, stop frequently, stop on the marina go, green and go kite flying. So here, Marcella looks a little older, so maybe she's like 87, and I'm, you know, my aunt would have been in her 80s. And I just love this picture, you know, this 87 year whoa, you know, I mean, have fun. Another story to tell on Marcella, she also liked to go to this restaurant, Senior Pico's, um, that used to be uh, where the uh, McCormick and Coletto's is now at the Ghirardelli Square. It wasn't for the view. It wasn't actually for the food. But it was for one particular dish, because she loved to order this dish. Son of a bitch stew. <laughs> <laughs> and so we would never give Marcella's, Marcella, what would you like? Son of a bitch stew. She just loved that. You know? uh, and uh, one time, we'd like to go to Balboa Cafe, and we always had Ramus fizzes. And uh, one time, the, the waitress came around to take our order, and she said, no, we'll have another Ramus. And one time she was a little tittering as we came out, but you know, we had, a, we had, a, we had great fun. Um, okay, diet and fitness, number five. This is common sense. This, I gotta tell you, this is common sense. Eat nutritiously, exercise regularly, eat nutritiously, low on sugars, low on fats, low on salt. Um, uh, vegetables, fruits, vegetables, um, uh, whole food, whole grains. Exercise regularly, um, 150 minutes a week, moderate exercise, preferably 30 minutes a day, um, at least five days a week. Regularly, moderate, aerobic exercise. No vices, no smoking, no drugs, alcohol in moderation. <laughs> alcohol in moderation. And I'll tell you, subjective, is, subjective health is key. This frequently comes up, subjective health. Great example was my mother. She would say, you know, I'm in good health. I'm in good shape for the shape. How are you doing? I'm in good shape for the shape I'm in. She had so many things wrong with her, but that's not her perception. Perceived health is key. Um, so here's the, I love this one of the Mediterranean diet pyramid. And part of the reason I really love it is if you notice on the bottom, the base is exercise. Exercise is key. So here I want to share with you um, some of the work of Dr. Jim Fries, who is professor of immunology and rheumatology over at Stanford Medical Center, really considered kind of the granddaddy of positive, of positive aging at a time when most literature focused on the failure of success in aging. He looked at it a little differently and, and felt that, you know, if you could push out, you know, you can, you can only push out human, like, like Tom mentioned, you can only push out human life so far. But if you can push the onset of a disability, you've compressed the period of illness or disability. So it's the compression of morbidity theory, which, with, which Jim is known for and which the research does indeed pan out. Um, three primary prevention techniques, common sense, no smoking, no obesity, exercise. That alone, and he's done studies with runners about our age, significantly pushed out the onset of, of, of chronic disease, and have found that 
even with uh, people like runners, it doesn't necessarily mean that they have um, more injuries, um, even though they're doing the running, uh, than, the, than the rest of the population. Some ger geriatricians, doctors, you know, some people will say in our field that, that the diseases of aging are really not of aging per se, but uh, they're of disuse. Exercise is really a key element, to the, key element to this. Let me tell you what the Alzheimer's Association says. Heart disease, high blood pressure, diabetes, and stroke can increase your risk of heart disease. Adopt a brain-healthy diet, physical exercise, because essential for maintaining, maintaining good flow to the brain, as well as encouraging new brain cells. Mental activity to keep you sharp. A low level of education does relate to a higher risk of Alzheimer's, so this Stanford education was good for you. Social engagement, social engagement, interaction maintains brain vitality, and isolation is related to a higher risk of Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's Disease Association would also say that exercise is more pr protective against Alzheimer's than any of the drugs, Alzheimer's drugs currently available. So exercise is key. Uh, the Stanford Health Improvement, um, ha Stanford has a HIP, Health Improvement Program. It's pro primarily, the, it's like their employee assistance program. It's, it's generally for staff and um, families and retirees. However, I spoke yesterday with um, Wes Allies, who runs the HIP program, because I said, you know, can alumni go? And he goes, sure. They can come. Your group can come. So if any of you are in this area and take a look at the HIP programs on, the, um, on their website that, you know, say that you're an alumni, you came to this session, and you can, you can actually take advantage of those. Um, so let's, let's talk about, okay, so here's Al and Napoleon. Napoleon's in the black, Al's in the white. I happen to, there's a bike, bike ride along the bay where I go. I've seen Al and Napoleon for years. And so finally, a couple of years ago when I was doing this bike ride, I decided to, you know, each time I go by, it's like this gerontologist in me needs to say something. So finally I stopped and said, you know, I think this is great. I see you guys out here all the time. So I decided I'd add them to my speech. So um, uh, a couple of months ago, I, I stopped them and asked if I could interview them. So interesting story with Al and Napoleon is that they, are, they, they met walking in 1997. They've been walking together three days a week since 1997. They um, are both 78 years old. And when Al was in his late 40s, he, he, oh, I asked, well, did you guys exercise a lot when you were younger? Well, Napoleon did. Al didn't, but he gave me the story. You know, I was in my late 40s, and uh, he worked downtown, San Francisco, and I just found that those lunches were too big, and I felt I was getting fat. And so, you know, instead of eating these big lunches, I decided to walk at lunch. So he started walking at lunch in his, in his late 40s. And then, um, and then I asked Napoleon about, well, you, I don't know, we kind of got into this question of, well, what did you eat for lunch? He says, well, I don't smoke, I don't drink, I always have had a lot of um, fruits and vegetables. I would always have fruits and vegetables when I was working, which I thought was really pretty amazing. You know, 78 years old, they kind of got it. A lot of this is common sense. They got it early on. But there's some other things to tell you about Al and Napoleon. Napoleon's been married 56 years. Al's been married 47 years. And I would also say that there's a social interaction on these walks. Let's call it the great debates. It happened that this is where they debate social issues, political issues, when they're out on the walk. And also some things that Al was in management and Napoleon was in the union, so they get into these things. But they always, <laughs> but they have a smile on your fa their face. You know, it's just this interaction, mental interaction, and that's a wonderful thing when you can combine the physical exercise, the mental exercise, the social, put it all together. Um, so. Now, the next person I want to talk to you about is Ed. Now, Ed ha got his, uh, actually, Ed's in the audience. Ed got his uh, master's degree in applied, uh, applied mechanics, applied mechanics here at Stanford, but then kind of fell into teaching, didn't want to work in the weapons industry, fell into teaching at Ravenswood, which, which led to a 30-year career as a teacher, primarily a high school teacher, in math. 
And this is Ed, actually just a couple of weeks ago, because every year for like the last 15 years, he and a group of guys go on this hike in the Sierras. And they hike in about 15, you know, 12 to 15 miles in and back. They're out there for about eight days. So eight, eight days, that's probably about a seven miles a day of hiking. And this is how Ed breaks wood for the fire. So he just gets the biggest, bold, you know, a boulder, and then he just throws it on the wood. This is how Ed breaks wood for a fire. And then afterwards, afterwards, Ed does some yoga. Now, sorry, it's a little out, but then he'll do some yoga out in, you know, after he's done these seven-mile hikes and whatever, then he does yoga out here. Now... The other thing I have to tell you about Ed, you can't really tell from these pictures, but Ed just had his 69th birthday last week. And now you might say that, you know, Ed had maybe some genetics in here. Nah, I don't think it's genetics, but I would say it's role models, and I would say there's an education factor here. But I don't know if you've heard of the Delaney sisters who've written, lived to over, um, Bessie, um, Sadie's sitting down, she passed at 109, Bessie's leaning over her, Bessie passed at 104. It happens that Ed's mother was their younger sister. <laughs> so, um, but I think that's that role model. So that's what I want, I want you to think of the role models in your family. I, don't, I think it's not so much genetics as it was role models in his family. And so what Bessie and Sadie would say is, here's what they say about exercise. We get up with the sun, and the first thing we do is exercise. God gave you only one body, so you'd better be nice to it. And for the last 35 years of their life, so if you're 105 minus 35, you know, 70, they've been, they were doing yoga. And the, I, I couldn't find a picture of it, but in their book, you can actually see them doing these yoga stances. So, so that must have come. Maybe that's what came through, again, by seeing them. And actually, when... Um, Bessie is going to be there ready for, ready for Ed in heaven, and they're going to dance together at those pearly gates. Um, so next one, how will you paint your canvas? This gets to kind of using your mind. A future awaits you at any age. Be creative and learn new things. Discover the wonder with passion because this is hope. This is hope for the future. There is a future. A future awaits you at any age. My best example I can give you for this is Lithia. Now, you would think this was Lithia's birthday party. This is kind of like somebody gave her flowers for her birthday. And my friend Randy is her niece, and this is Larry, her, Randy's husband. Um, but actually, and in this picture, Lithia is 92 years old. But this actually wasn't her birthday. This was actually her graduation last year from college. She graduated with a degree in English literature and a minor in music. And she lives back east. And the biggest turmoil in her mind was the school that she wanted to go, the, the school where she got her undergraduate degree didn't have the master's degree that she wanted. So if she wanted to get her master's degree, she'd have to go across, to, across the Hudson River. And she was trying to figure out a bus schedule. So education at any age leads to successful aging. So, um, OK, last, you know, it's not ultimately about you, but it is to start. You really have to be your own best friend. Because if you don't value yourself enough, you're not going to do these things that are best for you. You know, this is what gets you past the denial. You value yourself enough. But then it's not all about you. You have to let go of self, and you transcend into a greater purpose of life. And this is that civic engagement. This is the, the giving back in the world. Um, and you want to pass on to the, next, to the next generation. This is the generativity that, you know, as we become older, we're passing on to that next genera the next generation and getting beyond, getting beyond ourselves, up Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, actually, wait a minute. I want to I end with a, a story on Ed that doesn't have a picture. But um, Ed got into meditation uh, some 80, 80, 30 years ago. And he said it really, it, really changed his, it really changed his life. And when you interact with Ed, Ed is totally present to you. 
and there's a calmness and a peacefulness that you that you sense when you're with him. But he is totally he is totally present. So the way Ed gives back now, he has four four grandchildren. I think it's four four grandchildren. And um, he told me the one story where, where he, and totally present, as one little granddaughter opened his eyes one morning, Grandpa, are you up? <laughs> <laughs> totally present and very calm to that. Um, but more importantly, um, Ed has been on 30-day sits, 45-day sits, several 30-day sits, 45-day sits, in the silence. Um, he just came back from Donaldson, uh, prison in Alabama where for the third time he has uh, done a class with prisoners to teach meditation. So he just came back from 10 days in the silence uh, with prisoners in Alabama. So, so that's another way of getting beyond yourself and giving back. So the message is the choices you make will indeed determine the life that you live. And a joy-filled life really is your choice, and it can be there for you. Uh, so in closing, I would like to, um, I'd like to say, may your life be filled with no regrets. May you see the extraordinary in the ordinary. And may someone be there to brighten your world as you age. Thank you. Now, I see we do have a little time for any questions. If there are any, I'd be happy to um, answer them. Or there is a luncheon that awaits you outside and time to interact with people. What do you think about caloric restriction? Excuse me? Caloric restriction. Actually, that has been shown in mice. That's another way where they do feel that that has an ability to extend life. But um, as... Tom spoke earlier today, there's not a feeling, that, you know, there, there, there is a feeling that there's, there's a life expectancy. You know, we're not here to push human life to 200 years, but um, definitely caloric restriction, which also falls in line with these, um, you know, keep your weight under control, don't be obese, and it's, it's, it's pushing it further. So, yes, caloric restrictions would also be um, a more refined one, just as people who have a real low-fat diet would be a more, you know. Yes. We live in a small town and somebody put a band across the one small street that says, support your truth. <laughs> they did. Well, that's wonderful. The, support your troops. That's another way. Getting involved. Getting involved. The question was, the question, actually, the question was, what about introverts? Um, you know, actually, this, this idea of being independent in our culture, you know, we're going to be independent and we're going to do it. This is kind of the cultural norm of being independent and to the point of being, that is not, that is not best for you for when you're aging. So someone who is an introvert, I would say, step by step, try to get out to more people. And I would recommend that you, you know, maybe you do it more one-on-one. -on -one that you look at it in terms of those more meaningful relationships on one-on-one -on -one, rather than think that you need to make the friends of, you know, of thousands. That's what I would say for somebody who is an introvert, but I would say it is not a successful aging strategy. Yeah. You know, actually, that's a good point. Um, you see it frequently as, um, as, as an elder care advisor. You certainly see it frequently um, with older people um, having a companion. And yes, the love and affection for an animal can really be very supportive to an individual. Very true. But I, would not, I wouldn't replace people for the animal. I would supplement people with animals in your life. <laughs> yes? How do you help, how do you help people deal with 
Right. Well, you know what? I'd be happy to talk to you. Sure. The okay. The question. It was a question on hoarding, but that's actually an elder care question, which I'm happy to um, discuss afterwards. But I was going to stick on um, aging, successful aging today for questions. Hello. As we talked about um, yeah. the importance of forgiveness, forgiving, um, forgiving yourself for. Um, no, it's forgiving others about them not being the parents you wanted or whatever. Mm -hmm. What about the importance of asking for forgiveness of other people as far as releasing a burden from you? Say it again, asking other people to... For, to forgive you for maybe, maybe you've decided you haven't been the best daughter you could be or the best sister. You know, you can't, you can't, you can't, um, modify other people's behavior. So I think the fact of you forgiving yourself, that really becomes key. It would be great if you could, but you can't depend. Then, it, then you're pushing it out to somebody else defining you. So the real key is to get the forgiveness within yourself, regardless of what that other person might feel. One more question. One more question. I, I agree with it. Exercise. You know, if I had to give anything, the, the key for this health, mental, mental and physical health is exercise. The key for emotional well-being is social support, social interaction. So use it or lose it, absolutely. Inactivity, yes, yeah. Go for it. I think I'm that's Ted it. Kay. I'm a class secretary for the class of 79, and I'm subbing for Randy Livingston, who had to leave. I want you all to thank Esther for this. Oh, thank you. Oh, oh. Oh, my goodness. And on behalf of our class of 1979, who is honored to to bask in the reflective glory of, of Esther. We have a gift for her. Oh, well, and how thank nice. You all, oh, thank, and thank you. Thank you, Esther. Thank